Hey everyone, welcome back to Upside Down Data. Today I want to talk a little bit about DOT, where it is right now in its current price action, and some fundamental factors to consider when considering whether or not DOT will come out strong on the other end of this bear market. If you like the content, remember to subscribe to the channel, give the video a like and follow us on Twitter, put a lot of updates, better indicators, and more over there. So if you've been someone who's been following DOT, you know, the last you know number of months have been incredibly painful, right? You know, DOT has almost completely round-tripped from its prices back around when it first launched as a network, right? You know, these prices down here ranging between, you know, three and four dollars roundabout. You know, we're trading at seven dollars, not a far cry off of those initial values. An incredibly painful drawdown, more or less just down only ever since November. We're down 87% off the highs. We're, we're down a maximum of about 89% off of the highs back in November of 21. So this is pretty brutal. And so what I want to talk about first is just what should we think about DOT? You know, is there any signs of relief from this downtrend? And you know, is there any possibility of at least a relief rally coming? And then I want to transition into some of those fundamental factors. So to talk a bit about where DOT is with its price action, I want to first talk about some of our indicators here at the channel. I want to start with the market direction classifier or MDC. If you're uh, not familiar with this indicator, basically it's supposed to capture these more macro moves to basically identify when the asset's likely to put in a move to the upside and then when it's bearish, when a big drawdown is likely. And so this yellow line here is the critical value, the critical price. Basically, if the price is above this value, then that's bullish and that means that an uptrend is quite possibly in the cards. And if it's below that level, that means that a downtrend is quite plausible. And so you, see, you can see this does a good job of identifying these uh, these times. And I've shown in the past that this will outperform things like the 20-week moving average as being a better way of identifying these macro trends. And so more or less, coming off of November, we've just been in the red, except for this kind of small swing trade here back in around um, March, April. And then just, just down only pretty much ever since then. And we are getting sort of close, right? You know, we are we are getting closer to the critical level, though we're not quite there yet. So the critical level is a dynamic level. It'll be changing over time. But, you know, we're looking more hopeful now than we had in a while where we were just miles off of the critical level. So from a trend perspective, you know, we're not quite at a point yet where we might want to get too excited, but we're getting close. And certainly if Bitcoin and some of the other assets have a relief rally in the coming um, months, I would expect DOT to join in with the party. We don't know yet if that's going to materialize, but it's one thing that is possible, something to keep an eye on for sure. And then I'll, of course, be updating folks as these indicators start to flip bullish. So DOT has not flipped bullish yet, but some other assets are showing some signs of a possibility of at least a relief type, shorter term relief rally, um, possibly being on the horizon. So we'll have to wait and see if that actually materializes. Now, again, of course, none of this is financial advice. You should form your own opinions. But, you know, we're a lot closer now than we have been in a while. So that's where I, I think that if we do end up flipping above this level and be able to show some strength, that could mean that at least a temporary relief rally could happen. Now, another indicator we can look at is the Momentum Bias Indicator, or MBI. So this is an indicator that, if you're not familiar, basically tries to capture what is the overall prevailing momentum in the market. So um, zero on the MBI. So I should note that this, this green and red line now is the MBI level. And then the yellow line is dots price across time. And so um, the zero is the average amount of momentum that's in the asset. And so for dot, you know, this is actually now going to be slightly positive because overall dot is still up overall, although it's actually probably going to be, if we do fall back down to these levels, this might actually be a more neutral level of momentum between upwards and downwards momentum. But then the, the values then, so one would be one standard deviation above the mean. We've actually never hit down close to negative one. So that's why that's not on the chart here. And so the idea is that if you're in the positives, that means that there's prevailing upwards momentum bias, right? That means that price is generally going to be moving to the upside. Momentum is generally going to be in the, to the positive and any kind of corrections are quickly um, bought up and then pushed back up to the upside even more. So it's bear or excuse me, it's bull market behavior. So positive momentum bias goes along with bull market behavior. Negative momentum bias goes along with bear market behavior and vice versa. So basically, if you're seeing a lot more red than green, that's not a good sign. That means that you're in a bear market. 
seeing a lot more green than red. That's good news. That means you're in a bull market. So we're very much still in bear market territory for the MBI here. But at the very least, even as price has been dropping, we are getting somewhat of a potential bullish divergence where the MBI is actually moving to the upside while price has been moving to the downside, which means that the strength of that negative momentum has actually been weakening in these recent weeks and months, even though price has been continuing to slide to the downside. So obviously what we'd like to see to get more hopeful is to be able to reclaim positive momentum bias and, you know, to be hopeful of a longer, you know, more meaningful rally, we'd like to spend a lot of time up in the green. You know, oftentimes what you'll see in bear markets is spend a lot of time in the red, hook your head up above zero, above that average point, and then quickly just get rejected to the downside and have another leg down. That's what we saw back here early in the year in 22 before this big move to the downside. And so, you know, what we could see if we get, a, get kind of a short-term relief rally is move back up, poke your head above zero, but then watching that closely is going to be important. Do we just crash again to the downside, which could mean that any relief that we see is just quickly sold off and maybe even see newer lows? Or are we in, are we able to actually start spending time up here or start kind of oscillating around zero? Because in some other assets like Bitcoin, for example, you'll see this kind of oscillation around zero happen in transition points between bear and bull markets. So that's something that we'd like to see happen is get back up, spend some time in the green, and then not just collapse way down into deep red again like we saw back here. So this one is more hesitant to get to, to get excited, right? You know, with the the MDC, it'll call a possible at least short-term um, trend change if we just break above this critical level, which we're fairly close to right now. The MDC is going to require a little bit more um, proof of positive momentum bias before it flips green. And then when it does, we'd like to, to spend more time up here so still very much in a bear market and that's why my base case still remains with dot and frankly the rest of the crypto market that any rallies we see right now are like more likely to be relief rallies than they are to be you know bringing us right up to new all-time highs but you know at the very least it could be relief rallies that start helping us put in a bottom we don't know yet you know i'm not going to sit here and say the bottom's in because i have no idea but these are just some things i'm looking at so if we're just going to summarize you know what i'm seeing for dots price action still bearish still bearish not really much reason to be too excited yet but we're getting a lot closer to that now than we were back you know over here or back you know over here you know there's not any reason to be excited back here or back here a little bit more reason to be paying attention and be thinking that maybe at least some even if it's only short term um, upside movement could be plausible okay so that's kind of where we are with price action, let's now talk a little bit more about some of those fundamental factors I was mentioning. So with an asset like DOT, you know, one of the questions we have to ask with any altcoin is, will it survive the bear market? And if it does survive the bear market, what are its prospects after that, right? Because there are a lot of kind of zombie projects that will survive a bear market, but they never go on to realize anything close to their prior all-time highs. They kind of just slowly die. And so I think the question we have to ask with DOT is, you know, first, will it survive? And then if it does survive, Will it be able to come out the other side strong and then ultimately go on to set new all-time highs? And that's where fundamental analysis, in my opinion, tends to be a lot more useful because we can just get an idea of where does this asset stand relative to other crypto assets and does it make sense for it to be able to survive and thrive later on or not so much? And so one of the things that I like to look at with altcoins is, you know, what is its, you know, there's this term that's often thrown around in the traditional financial markets called the moat. And the idea of a moat for a company would be, is this company doing something that other companies can't directly compete with? Or are they doing something so much better than other companies that they're just kind of in a league of their own that's going to be really hard for someone else to catch up with them? And so in the crypto space, the question I would ask is, is an asset like DOT doing something that is different from other assets? And is, is it doing something in a way that's special, that sets us apart from other crypto assets, because that can be a moat. You know, Bitcoin has a moat in the sense that it's the most decentralized and most trusted, you know, blockchain out there. And that's kind of its network effect is its moat in a sense. Um, similar to Ethereum, it's just got that first mover advantage, so much more buildings happening on it, that's its moat. And I think personally, the moat that DOT might have is its interoperability um, built into its protocol. So, you know, interoperability is basically the idea of multiple different um, chains to seamlessly communicate with each other and be able to interact with each other in a very simple way. And that's really from the ground up what DOT was designed to do. The idea is that you'll have these parachains that will build out on the DOT ecosystem. So here I'm just showing you all the different projects that are building 
on Dot and Kusama being Kusama is kind of the sister network to Dot. It's kind of the the test net for um for Dot. But they're all kind of together, and actually Dot and Kusama can also talk to each other. And so this is all just kind of one big happy ecosystem is the idea. And so there's tons of building on it, right? So that's the first thing you'd like to see is just a ton of building on the platform. And the nice thing about DOT compared to some other chains is that, you know, with Ethereum, everything's on the Ethereum blockchain, which means there can be a lot of congestion, a lot of, you know, bottlenecking that happens because everyone's fighting over the same block space. But with DOT, it's different because with DOT, you actually have all these different parachains that are having their own, you know, kind of uh, blocks that they're producing, but then they're also connected into the overall relay chain, which is actually the DOT network which helps them with things like security and then also for the interoperability. So it spreads the load out a little bit more, allows for greater throughput, and allows for some of these parachains to have quite high performance. Um, and, and also they're able to, off, you know, to, to use the relay chain dot for their security and things like that. So when we're talking about interoperability then, for dot to have a strong moat, in my opinion, you'd like to see a couple things. A, you'd like to see the technology just show show it's working right so you know really with interoperability on dot that's only been live for a little bit so we aren't really quite sure exactly how well it's going to work in the long run but so far so good you know it's not been a bad start by any means and there's a lot of interest in building on it now dot is a relatively young ecosystem you know the parachain auctions didn't really even happen until back over here later stages of last year but the fact there's a lot of building is hopeful. And if DOT can, during this bear market, build up a robust and large interoperable ecosystem, that would kind of set it apart from a lot of other chains. Because, you know, with a lot of other chains, they're having to rely on bridges to communicate across blockchains, right? You can't just immediately, by default, have Ethereum communicate with Algorand, for example. You need to have a bridge that's its own special separate thing that can then help bring those chains together. And one of the issues with bridges that's come out is that they've been very much susceptible to hacks and exploits which have cost different chains a lot of money so the most recent example that i'm aware of is the harmony chain that got exploited for 100 million um in crypto which to my understanding at least so far they have not been able to get back and you know harmony is not alone you know there was the big axie infinity hat with the, their ronin kind of side chain that had a bridge to ethereum i think that was about 600 million that that got hacked for you know really not great and so the, the idea of having a network that doesn't need to rely on bridges, that allows for inter interoperability across its ecosystem natively, kind of different chains uh, communicating to each other just natively without that security risk is a huge potential advantage. Now, it is important to mention, though, that DOT is not the only player in this space, right? You know, the other kind of big one out there is the Cosmos ecosystem, which is all about interoperability as well. So with Cosmos, you have a bunch of different separate blockchains that are all directly interoperable with each other and so cosmos is, is a relatively you know proven at this point it's been doing this for a while um but of course cosmos has taken a bit of a, a hit recently in this ecosystem where you know uh terra luna which is now called terra classic was its kind of flagship chain it actually had gotten to the point where it was larger than cosmos itself it was the largest cosmos ecosystem chain and then you know obviously we know what happened with luna absolutely collapsed after the the terra ust debacle but you know it's still around and, and and the strength of the tech for atom isn't doesn't depend on that right just because i had one chain that blew up on it doesn't mean the tech itself is bad and so I, I would kind of see the cosmos ecosystem as being one of the bigger competitors for dot in the interoperability space now there is a lot of arguments that people have for why owning dot over over um atom is more advantageous just because there's there actually are more built-in demand drivers for DOT than there are for Atom, which actually has um, relatively few built-in demand drivers. And so I think that's just a, a decision that people have to make for themselves of which of these they think has a stronger fundamental um, narrative from the interoperability space. But we think of that idea of a moat, you know, does DOT stand apart from some of these other ones? You know, really Cosmos is the only other large chain that really offers that kind of interoperability competition. Otherwise, DOT is kind of on a league of its own. And a lot of these other kind of layer one blockchains that are out there, you know, your Algorands, your Harmonies, um, etc., they don't really, you know, so far they don't have anything like this built out. Now, I think a lot of them are putting a lot of resources into expanding their interoperability, but they're not there yet. And so from that perspective, DOT is a step ahead. And so to the extent that a lot of building can happen on DOT, that might set it up well for the future. And so that's one thing that I, I'm personally looking at with DOT is that, you know, 
obviously on a technical perspective, price action perspective, it's not looking particularly attractive right now. But I do think that it has a reasonable shot of coming out the other side of this strong if a lot of building can happen on its network. Now, again, this is just my opinion. You should form your own opinion of where you think DOT's going. But that's what I'm looking at is I think the fundamentals are still sound. Now, the question, of course, is if this bear market draws out and if other chains get built, you know, it's possible some other project will get built with even better interoperability tech that could then take away that moat. But so far, you know, I'm not aware of that. And there's also the fact that, you know, DOT has a pretty large network effect. You know, it is a larger market cap asset. And so more people are aware of it. It's on more exchanges. There's more liquidity, which can also help it if, you know, if the bear market or if the next kind of big move to the upside isn't too terribly far away, that can also help it, even if it isn't necessarily still the strongest on the tech side. But from a moat perspective, I do think that DOT stands fairly well right now from a fundamental perspective. So I personally expect DOT to survive the bear market. And I think it has a very reasonable chance of doing well on the other side. But of course, time will tell. And we also don't know what narratives are going to drive the next bull run. It could be that at that point, no one cares about, you know, kind of the base layers, you know, your layer zeros like DOT or your layer ones um, or anything like that. Or if interoperability is already solved enough through better bridge technology, maybe people don't care anymore. But assuming that doesn't happen, assuming interoperability is still a challenge that isn't fully solved by then, I think DOT could do quite well. Now, the final thing I want to bring up, though, with this is that just because I believe that DOT has strong fundamentals and I think it will ultimately survive, you know, that doesn't mean that I'm, you know, thinking that right now is the time to just back up the truck and just, you know, go all in on DOT or anything. Obviously, I never make a recommendation for that. You know, I'm not here to give you advice, just telling, telling you about the data and kind of my thoughts. But I see a lot of people kind of have this mindset in crypto that if, if you think the asset is strong, that you have to own it right now. Right, this idea that if, if you think an asset like DOT is strong fundamentally, then you have to own it right now. And if you don't own it, or if you sell it, that you're some kind of, kind of a traitor. You know, you're betraying the project. Many things that are, I think, are, are questionable about that approach. First off, this idea about not getting married to your investments. Right, you know, it doesn't matter how strong you think the asset is. The asset doesn't care what you think about it. Price is going to do what price is going to do. And so, you know, the the network is not going to be offended or betrayed if you sell out of it. The network doesn't give a crap. The network doesn't care. This is all ultimately about making money, right? You know, it's investment. You're trying to make money. And so if diamond hands, you know, it's refusing to sell even in the face of a possible massive drawdown in price is something you feel is necessary because you think the asset is strong. I personally question that. I, I don't think that's necessarily the right approach. I think there's no shame in following an asset, thinking it's fundamentally strong, but then waiting for a potentially more favorable entrance, right? You know, if you hadn't been getting into DOT, but you think it's a favorable, um, a, it's a, a strong fundamental asset, doesn't mean you have to immediately just YOLO in and try to buy everything. So personally, what I'm looking for with DOT is when does the trend look like it's starting to change? When is are things like the market director and classifier flipping bullish? When is the MBI flipping bullish? And with an altcoin, you know, if you're about to go into a big run like this, do you care if you necessarily buy at the absolute bottom versus up here? Because again, with these altcoins, you know, when you think it's the bottom, like let's say right here, for example, a lot of people might have thought this was the bottom, you know, you then end up having times where you can go ahead and drop another 50% to the downside. And that is, of course, not anything that anyone wants to stay, stay in. So I think there's a lot of what happens with these altcoin communities where people kind of look at anyone who dares to sell as being kind of these these traitors, these betrayers, that thing is, is completely silly. I think that people ultimately need to manage their risk. They need to be doing what they think is best for their portfolio's growth. And, you know, I think ultimately, you know, there's a lot of this kind of toxicity from maximalists in these altcoin spaces who really try to bully people into not selling, which ultimately just leads people to lose a lot of money, which I think is frankly pretty ridiculous. And so from my personal perspective, there's never anything wrong with making a decision that you think is right at the time. And especially for an asset like DOT, you know, there's nothing wrong with not owning DOT if you think it's fundamentally strong, for example. And also there's nothing wrong with owning DOT if you don't think it's fundamentally strong, if you think it's gonna go up a bunch in price. You know, if ultimately the goal is to make money, that's ultimately what we should be about. And so I personally see the fundamental conversation as being just something more about long-term expectations, but then decisions about what to do in the shorter term in terms of investment, and are a little bit more nuanced. And I think there's nothing wrong with waiting for a trend reversal. Now, again, not financial advice. If you think that this is a good time to be buy, buy DOT, by all means, go ahead and buy DOT. If you think this is a bad time to buy DOT, by all means, don't buy DOT. If you have DOT and you want to sell it, by all means, do it. If you don't have DOT and you want to buy it, you know, do it. You know, I'm not going to be here to tell you what to do. 
But personally, with these altcoins, I'm not going to be getting too excited until I see some more hopeful signs of a trend reversal. Because again, if you buy in thinking it's the bottom and you're wrong, and we draw end up you know going from these levels and going back all the way back down to the four to five dollar range, that could be another forty percent drawdown if we go back down there. So you know it's just something to keep in mind with altcoins. They're risky. They can keep falling even if they've already fallen eighty seven percent. They can keep going to the downside. And so I think it's just a matter of, in my opinion, watching the data, evaluating when probabilistically it seems like a good entry, and then going from there. All right, if you like the content, remember to subscribe to the channel, give the video a like and follow us on Twitter. But a lot of updates, better indicators, and more over there.